I know some of you looked at the video length when you clicked on this video. So just for you, I'm putting up a timer at the top right corner. Welcome back to Private Pilot Ground School. In this video, we're talking about aeromedical factors, and these are medical issues that can happen when you're flying. Here's what's on the list. We have hypoxia, hyperventilation, middle ear and sinus issues, spatial disorientation, some illusions, carbon monoxide poisoning, drugs and alcohol, decompression, and finally vision. Hypoxia is not enough oxygen or a reduced amount of oxygen. The main concern with this for us as pilots is the oxygen flow to the brain is reduced. That can reduce your mental function and it can also have detrimental effects on your decision making. So hypoxia is very important. There are four types of hypoxia. Hypoxic hypoxia is insufficient oxygen available to the body. This is probably one of the most common ones. As you climb up in altitude, there is less pressure. The oxygen concentration stays the same as you climb up. However, there are fewer air molecules, which means there's less oxygen available for breathing. Just for comparison, at 18,000 feet, there's half as much air pressure as there is at sea level. Try taking half a breath every time you breathe. Hypemic hypoxia means there's not enough blood. You might have enough oxygen in your lungs, but your blood can't distribute it to all the parts that need it. Now this can happen because of a loss of blood, maybe you had carbon monoxide poisoning, or you had a blood donation recently. Stagnant hypoxia means not flowing. In other words, your blood has enough oxygen in it, but it's not flowing. If you've ever had one of your limbs fall asleep, that's because you cut off the circulation to it, and your blood became stagnant or not flowing. In flying, you can get stagnant hypoxia when you pull excessive Gs during maneuvers. Obviously not at a private pilot level, but if you're a stunt pilot doing some air shows and things like that, this is why fighter pilots wear G-suits, is to prevent this stagnant hypoxia from happening. And finally, histotoxic hypoxia is the inability of your cells to use oxygen. You have oxygen available, it's being moved by the blood to your cells, but they can't use it. And this most likely is because of drugs or alcohol in your system, which is another reason why flying and drugs and alcohol don't really mix. The symptoms for hypoxia vary by individual, but usually it starts with the feeling of euphoria and being carefree. Uh, personally, I get headaches starting at about 10,000 feet. As your body gets more oxygen deprived, your extremities, like your fingers and your toes, they start to get a little tingly because there's not enough oxygen getting to them. And your flying gets less and less coordinated as time goes on. Eventually you get to a point where you can't do a simple task like putting on an oxygen mask to save your life. I would highly encourage you to look up altitude chamber videos on YouTube. You can see what hypoxia actually looks like from the outside. And these are filmed under medical supervision in an altitude chamber. I believe the FAA still does training sessions where you can sign up and go to Oklahoma to do an altitude chamber. All that being said, the only treatment for hypoxia is oxygen. If you have an oxygen mask, put it on. If you don't, descend to a lower altitude. And the sooner you do it, the better. The effects of hypoxia get reversed very quickly once you get oxygen into your bloodstream. Starting at about 10,000 feet, as you go up, hypoxia increases in intensity. There's a chart right here that tells you your total time of useful consciousness. This is the time in which you can make a rational life-saving decision and then do it before passing out. And if you look, some of those numbers don't exactly look very promising as you go higher and higher. You're probably more familiar with hyperventilation. This is excessive breathing and doing this depletes your blood of carbon dioxide. In other words, you're breathing out too much carbon dioxide. As you're flying, you might get in a stressful situation and you might naturally increase your breathing rate. If you're at a higher altitude, this could also be a problem with less oxygen available. The symptoms of hyperventilation are fairly similar to hypoxia, but the treatment is to breathe slowly. Sometimes that's difficult to do, but the best way to do it is like you've seen in the movies, breathe into a paper bag or any bag. Something else that helps is talking aloud. If you start talking, you can't really breathe quickly. And believe it or not, this does help. As we climb and descend, gases in our body expand due to pressure differences outside and inside our body. One of the places this happens is inside your ear and your sinuses. On the outside of your body, you have the ear canal and that ends at the eardrum. That's the outside air pressure. On the other side of the eardrum, you have your middle ear and this is usually where air gets trapped and causes ear pain. Leading from your middle ear is a eustachian tube and that goes to the back of your throat. Usually it's closed, but as you open your mouth to chew or talk or swallow, 
that opens up and equalizes pressure in your middle ear and the back of your throat. During a climb, the pressure on the outside of your ear decreases, and if your middle ear pressure stays the same, that will cause your eardrum to be pushed outward, and that causes discomfort, actually quite a bit of it. On the descent, the opposite happens. The pressure increases on the outside of the ear and pushes the eardrum in. To prevent pain, you need to equalize the pressure on the outside and on the inside. One of the best ways to do that is to simply talk. Talk to yourself, talk yourself through what you're doing, talk to air traffic control, talk to your passengers. As long as your mouth is moving, usually that'll keep you from having ear pain. If you can't get rid of that discomfort on the descent, what you can do is probably what you've seen in the movies. You pinch your nose shut, you close your mouth, and you slowly blow push some of that air through the eustachian tube into your middle ear to pressurize it a little bit more and make the pressures equal. Now if you're sick, the eustachian tube can get inflamed and it can get constricted in some people more than others. And if the pressures don't equalize, that will cause you a lot of pain. Not to mention that it can damage your eardrums. So if you're sick, don't go flying. That's probably the most ignored piece of advice. Something else that can cause you pain while you're flying is your sinuses. They vent to the outside through small openings that can get clogged if you're sick. Once again, don't fly when you're sick. Now if you do have a sinus block, you'll usually notice it on the descent. And the best way to fix it is to descend really slowly and have that pressure change slowly over time. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Okay, well I'm like a little bit sick, why don't I just spray my nose with some spray and then take some Tylenol or something and that should be fine. That's all fine and dandy, but make sure you're using FAA approved medication when you fly. Believe it or not, when you're flying you need to be at your best in terms of decision making and not being impaired. And some of the medication has side effects as you probably know. So make sure you ask your aviation medical examiner if the drugs you're taking are approved. This is an unapproved list of FAA medications that you can look at for reference. However, make sure you ask your AME if the drugs you're planning to take are allowed with the FAA. Spatial disorientation is kind of what it sounds like. Your body is unable to tell what your pitch is, what your bank is, or where you are in space. For orientation, your body relies on three different systems. You have your visual, vestibular, and somatosensory. In most conditions, the three systems agree with one another. When you get on a boat or an airplane, these three systems can disagree with one another and they can cause motion sickness or even worse, spatial disorientation. In visual conditions, your eyes or your visual system gets used the most, with the other two backing it up. As it gets dark and you start flying at night or you fly in instrument conditions, your visual senses can't really be reliable and you can get disoriented. Take a look. The sky is overcast and the visibility poor. That reported five mile visibility looks more like two and you can't judge the height of the overcast. Your altimeter says you're at 1500 feet, but your chart tells you there's terrain in the area as high as 1200 feet. Still, you've flown through weather like this before, so you press on. You find yourself easing back slightly on the controls to give yourself more clearance. Then, with no warning, you're in the soup. You peer so hard into the mist that your eyes hurt. You swallow, only to find your mouth dry. Somewhere, a voice is saying, you should have turned back. You now have 178 seconds to live. You push the rudder and add a little pressure on the controls to stop the turn. But this feels unnatural, and you return the controls to their original position. This feels better, but now your compass is turning a little faster, and your airspeed is increasing. You scan the panel for help, but you don't find any. It doesn't make any sense. You're sure you'll break out in a few minutes, but you don't have a few minutes. You now have 100 seconds to live. You glance at your altimeter and are shocked to see it unwinding. You're already down to 1,200 feet. Instinctively, you pull back on the controls, but the altimeter still unwinds. The tack is in the red, and the airspeed's almost there too. You now have 45 seconds to live. Now you're sweating and shaking. There must be something wrong with the controls. Pulling back only moves the airspeed deeper into the red. You can hear the wind tearing at the airplane. You have 10 seconds to live. 
So this is what happens when a non-instrument rated pilot loses visual contact. Your vestibular system senses movement by using your inner ear. Inside your inner ears you have three semicircular canals and they just so happen to be arranged at roughly 90 degrees to each other. And this way they can sense yaw, pitch and roll. Each one of the semicircular canals is filled with fluid and also has some hair cells in there that can sense when the fluid accelerates. And the keyword being accelerates. Once the fluid achieves a steady state, it's really hard to tell what's going on. So for example, if you're banking into, let's say, a 30 degree turn, you can tell you're turning. Once you're established in a turn for, let's say, 10 seconds, it's really hard for your inner ear to tell that you're in a turn. And this is where multiple systems working together back each other up. And you can visually tell that, yes, I'm in a turn, unless you can't see outside. In that case, even some normal forces can cause extremely convincing illusions that are really different to what exactly is going on. And it's really hard to convince your body otherwise. And this is why instrument training is really valuable. It's not just to fly in instrument conditions, but actually to help you stay upright. And finally, the somatosensory system as it's really hard to pronounce sometimes, is referred to as the seat of the pants flying. In other words, your body can feel your skin, the joints, and the pressure on all of those. If you've ever been in a quickly accelerating car, you get pushed back into the seat and you can quote-unquote feel the acceleration as your body's pressed back. Or if you've gone over the hill on a roller coaster, you can feel weightless, and that's the somatosensory system. Now, unfortunately, when you're flying, your body has a hard time differentiating between acceleration, between gravity, when you're maneuvering your airplane like in a turn. Now let's look at a couple of illusions where these three systems might not be in agreement. The Coriolis illusion happens when you're in a turn, you've established a turn, you've been there for a while, your ear canals have stabilized and you're all good, and then you drop your pencil and you're like, oh wait a minute, I need that pencil. So you quickly go to pick it up and then you bring your head back and the whole world is spinning because your ear has now sensed motion and you might try doing something like putting an airplane in an attitude where it shouldn't be because you're thinking something's happening when it actually isn't. So this is why even for a private pilot certificate it's valuable to have a little bit of instrument time so you can interpret what's going on with the instruments and convince your brain that what the instruments are saying is more accurate than what your fluid inside your ear is telling you. Now practically speaking, if you do drop something, make sure when you pick it up you either don't move your head in any different direction and just kind of reach over and extend your arm or use minimal head movement if you have to. Now if we were to try to explain the video a little bit, this next illusion plays a big part, the graveyard spiral. So once again you get into a turn, you get established there, your body's not experiencing any sensation that you're turning, and then you decide to turn back to level flight. Well, as you do, if you don't have any visual references, you can experience the sensation of turning in the opposite direction. If you're disoriented, you might turn back to what your original bank was. Since you typically lose altitude while you're turning, you might have an instinct to pull back up on the stick. Meanwhile, all your brain is thinking is, okay, so I'm level now and I'm descending. So let me pull back a little bit more. Let me try to get back to level. Meanwhile, you're in a bank and you're tightening that turn, which eventually turns into a spiral, and that's what you saw in the video. The heading indicator kept spinning, but the person felt like everything was normal. If these illusions are kind of interesting, there's more of them in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Let's look at a couple more illusions. These are optical illusions. One of the things that can happen is if you start flying into different airports, you might get a runway width illusion. For example, if you fly at an airport with a wide runway, and then you go to an airport with a narrow runway, the narrow runway will make you feel like you're higher than you actually are. And if you don't recognize this, you'll end up having a lower approach and maybe even run into things on short final if you don't take that into account. If you go somewhere that has a wider than normal runway, it'll make you feel like you're lower than you're supposed to be, which will lead you to a high approach and probably floating down the runway. When runways and terrain slopes, that can really mess with you. An upsloping runway or terrain can make you think that you're at a higher altitude than you actually are, and you'll end up flying a lower approach. On the other hand, if a runway is sloping downward, it might make you think that you're at a lower altitude than you're supposed to be. Something else that you really don't think of are runway approach lights. If you have really bright lights, they'll make you think that you're a lot lower than you should be. 
To prevent these illusions, a couple things you can do. First of all, expect them. Know that they happen at night more than in the daytime and in marginal weather, when you have fog or haze or bad visibility. You should also rely more on instruments, especially your altimeter. And then if you have pappies or vasies, follow them. Why not? Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas. So you can't smell it, you can't see it, and it really likes to attach itself to your hemoglobin in your bloodstream, which results in hypemic hypoxia. Now, why is this an issue for pilots? Carbon monoxide happens as a byproduct of combustion. So as an engine runs, you get exhaust, and in that exhaust you have carbon monoxide. And you can't smell it or taste it or see it. The way we get heat in a single engine airplane is by heating up the air that surrounds the exhaust and that gets ventilated into the cabin. It's held in what's called an exhaust shroud. Basically it's a tube around the exhaust where the air gets heated up. If there is a leak in the exhaust system, you can get carbon monoxide inside your cabin. And because it's odorless and colorless, your only defense is smelling exhaust fumes if you can, if there's a big enough leak. Or the alternative is one of these cheap little carbon monoxide detectors that you can stick anywhere. This stuff is bad and it's poisonous. Some symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are headaches, blurred vision, dizziness, drowsiness, and loss of muscle power. So obviously you don't want any of those things when you're flying and this is why you want to get as much fresh air in as possible. So if you suspect some sort of carbon monoxide, you can turn off all the heat and open up all the fresh air vents and windows that you have. And also if you have oxygen, you go on oxygen. Alcohol impairs you. And if you didn't know that, surprise! Your performance as a human being deteriorates and your ability to make decisions will go out the door. As a pilot, we're making hundreds of decisions over the course of any flight, and a lot of them are critical. And the last thing you want is an impaired decision maker when it comes to those critical decisions. If you do want to drink, do it on your own time, away from airplanes, and at least 8 hours before flight. Remember that the blood alcohol limit is 0.04 which is about half of what it is for driving a vehicle. Also keep in mind that with altitude, the effects of alcohol get multiplied quite a bit, and that can lead to histotoxic hypoxia like I mentioned earlier, where your cells can't use the oxygen in your blood. I mentioned drugs already and medications, they all have side effects, you know that if you've seen any of the commercials. Make sure you talk to your AME if you want to use a certain medication to see if it's approved by the FAA. Kind of on the same topic as alcohol and drinking stuff, Dehydration. Make sure you're hydrated when you're flying. Stay away from coffee and carbonated drinks and all those energy drinks. They will dehydrate you and cause fatigue as you come crashing down off the caffeine. Plain old water, it does wonders. And especially in the summertime, things can get hot, you can get sweaty, flights can get long. So make sure you have your water, make sure you're hydrated. If you're a scuba diver, you probably know about decompression sickness and controlled ascents. If you're not, just know that nitrogen bubbles can form under pressure and then they can cause pain when they expand after you're done scuba diving. When flying, you know that there's low pressure and those nitrogen bubbles can expand and cause even more pain. This is why there's a recommendation to wait before you go flying. Wait at least 12 hours before flying up to 8,000 feet altitude or 24 hours if you go above 8,000 feet. Also wait 24 hours if you needed a controlled ascent while you were diving. Now if you weren't depressed enough, here's a lovely chart of what can happen after scuba diving. The final subject on the list is vision. As I mentioned before, vision is one of the most important things that we use during flight. The human eye is incredible, but it's not without limitations. The way your eye sees things is by seeing light enter through the cornea at the front of your eyeball traveling through the lens and then it falling back on the retina at the back of the eyeball. The retina has light sensitive cells that will convert light into electrical signals that then get sent to your brain via the optic nerve in the back of the eye. There are two types of light sensitive cells, rods and cones. Cones are used for day vision and are present all around the retina but they're especially concentrated in the middle or in the center of field vision at the back of the retina and this area where they're concentrated is called the fovea. During the day you see the best details, color, depth and resolution with your central vision, so right in the middle of where you're looking. Rods on the other hand can't see color or detail or depth, but they're really sensitive in low light and they're really great at providing peripheral vision since they're not in the center. 
As I said, rods are not present in the fovea or in the middle of your vision, but they're further away, meaning that you don't have central vision at night, at least not as much as in the daytime. Keep in mind that if you're flying at night, it takes about 30 minutes for your rods to adapt to darkness. Any bright light can destroy that in just a few seconds, and you have to repeat the whole process again. At night, you need to do more scanning to actually see things outside of your cockpit. The Pilot Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge gives you a couple of good techniques, and both of which focus on the fact that you can't see anything in the center. Scanning and off-center viewing is needed to properly see what you're trying to look at. Keep in mind that you also don't have depth perception at night, since your rods are the only ones working. If you fly at night, you might see a couple of these night illusions. Autokinesis is what happens when you stare at a light against a black background. If you stare at it long enough, for about 10 seconds or so, it'll appear to move all by itself. You can also get a false horizon, where if you see a string of lights, it can appear as if that's the horizon, where in reality your horizon could be somewhere else. So that's it. Thanks for listening through all this aeronautical medical stuff. As always, comments and questions are welcome. Until next time, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning.